electrical engineer up until June of this year. I'm going to talk about large scale energy generation, things like this big power plant here in the photograph. Um, I'll say a little bit about those and I will also talk about renewable energy generation. See if I can get my, I oh, good, okay, all right, ah, I missed the one. Ah, ah, ah. Right, okay, renewable energy generation. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about um, some of the renewable um, power stations, the way that they operate. We'll also have a little look at the climate crisis um, and some of the things that we can do to solve the climate crisis going forward. If anyone has any questions while you're listening, then, then shout out or you can ask questions at the end. Um, so we're talking about energy generation at a national level. Um, so basically large power stations, um, which connect to the national grid and then go to people's houses and to offices and to industry. Um, and originally all power stations were effectively coal powered. So this is um, a colliery where I worked when I first left school. I was into uh, mass physics and chemistry. Um, so sort of going into doing a degree in engineering was it seemed sort of right for me. And when I came out, I worked in the coal industry, um, designing connectors which were used in coal mines like this. And the coal went to power stations like this, which had big water cooling towers, um, which put out lots and lots of steam, um, which could be quite acid, where you get acid rain from, um, big chimneys which produced um, the exhaust from the power stations and lots of carbon dioxide. So here's a coal powered power station, got mountains of coal coming in. The coal goes into a boiler, a furnace. The heat from burning the coal heats water up to steam. The steam drives a steam turbine, which then drives the generator. And that then creates electricity, which goes out over the transmission lines. The downside of that is that you're producing um, exhaust gases from the, the burning of the coal. Um, which go out into the atmosphere and that contains carbon. Um, and in this case, the water's going out to a river, but you also have those cooling towers, which can reduce acid rain. So you know, effectively, when, when I first came into the industry, coal was actually declining. Um, and we had the coal miners strike. Um, and at the same time, we'd um, we were developing oil fields out in the North Sea, away from Scotland and from Wales. And they have big oil platforms, which you still have, um, like this one here. And they produced oil. And you can see here, we've got an oil tanker. And that's up against an oil-fired power station. So it's exactly like a coal-fired power station, except we're burning oil. Um, and the oil, as you can see, is still producing lots of pollution and lots of carbon, which is going up into the atmosphere. We also have gas fired power stations and they're sort of quite different. Um, so a gas fired power station, if you think of a, um, a jet engine on an aircraft, a gas turbine, which you get in a gas fired power station is exactly like the jet engine on an aircraft, um, except it's on the ground, not on a plane in the air. Um, and the air comes in, gas comes in, the gas gets ignited, drives a turbine round, and on the end of a shaft, there's a generator. And that generates electricity and it does it very quickly. So you can switch them on and off, which is good on some occasions. If you say you've got a wind turbine and the wind drops off, you can bring in a gas turbine to replace the electricity you were producing from the wind. But it still puts out gases into the atmosphere. So it's still quite polluting and it's still putting out carbon into the atmosphere but it doesn't have the big um, water cooling towers that you can get on the other power stations. So those are quite traditional power stations that burn carbon. Um, and we could have stayed with those, but you have to say, well, why didn't we? Um, also, I, I have always forgot a photograph of me. The people that worked on these oil platforms, um, they had to be trained to do that. They had to be trained in what's called offshore survival. So 
things like underwater helicopter escape training where a helicopter goes into the sea, turns upside down, and you have to get out of the helicopter and swim up to the surface. Um, and marine survival training, which is what I'm doing here. I'm actually in a lifeboat, which is just about to be launched into the sea. This man next to me looks quite worried and I'm smiling. I don't know why that is, it's very strange. Um, so that was quite useful for when people started to work in offshore wind. But why did we come away from these traditional power stations? Um, and why are we trying to close them now? And it's a lot to do with global warming. So if you look at this, this little diagram here, um, if we do absolutely nothing, um, by about 2100, the, the Earth will have warmed up by four and a half degrees centigrade. If we follow these sort of policies we're working on at the moment to reduce the reliance on things like coal and oil, then the Earth will warm up by 3.6 degrees centigrade. And if we were to do what it says in the Paris pledges, where we said we'd get down to two degrees centigrade, the Earth will probably warm up by 2.7 degrees centigrade. And you might think, well, those are tiny amounts. Why does it matter? And it matters. Ah, it matters because those are averages. And the actual temperature, say, at the North Pole here in the, in the Arctic is much, much higher. It increases by 11 degrees. And that's enough to melt certainly the summer ice in the Arctic Circle. It's also enough you look at the heating that's occurring in North Africa, that's enough to create big deserts. And the temperature rise in the Pacific is enough to kill off the coral. So they, they, there are various stages that we can go through in heating in different parts of the world, and they will have big major effects on the environment. And we talk about having step changes where we go past a point where you can't really come back. So it, people became so concerned about this, this increase in temperature that even the, the, the major governments knew that they had to do something about it. Um, and what's causing that rise in temperature? Well, a big part of it is due to what we call greenhouse gases. And the major one is carbon dioxide coming from, mainly from generation of electricity, those power plants that we were looking at. So. It, People like me, who were working as engineers in the oil industry mainly, and coal before that, we then worked in other industries. And we had to say, well, actually, for people like yourselves listening, what can we do about the climate crisis? And you all know that you know, we can do more walking and cycling. This is a woodcraft group out cycling. We can need buses and trains. We can reuse, recycle, and repair. So this is from the put on a patch challenge. Um, um, reusing clothes rather than getting rid of them. Um, we can shout for change. So Greta Thunberg produced this very good book. It's a tiny little book, but it's got her speeches in it. And there's one where she's talking to the Houses of Parliament and she keeps repeatedly saying, is my microphone turned on? Can you hear me? And then right at the end of her speech, she says, is my microphone turned on? Can you hear me? because you don't seem to be listening. Um, definitely worth reading this book. And we can go out, and I know Pip's looking at, listening to this. I think you, you, you can recognize some of these. This is my old Woodcraft Coke, Coke district, Tolworth and Kingston. We can shout for change, and we can go out and take part in demonstrations, um, and basically make people in authority to listen. Which they are doing to some extent, but not fast enough. Um, and we can use renewable energy, um, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So we all know about solar panels on houses. You can see them if you walk around in the roads. You can see solar panels on houses. Um, that is producing renewable energy, but it's quite localized. So this is looking at renewable energy on a national scale to match those big power stations we were looking at before. And there is this, there's a little app here, which you can download um, and it shows exactly where, so it's how much electricity we're using and where it's coming from. So this is, I don't think it's there, you can't really see it, but yeah, you can, I think just about. So there's Bob Dean there and I'm holding up the app 
And in real time, I can see that we are using 40 gigawatts of electricity, which is actually quite a lot, and 223 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is a lot more than in that slide I've got in front of me. Um, and most of that is coming from gas. 41% of our electricity at the present time is coming from gas. And 20% is coming from wind, which isn't bad. We need to have lots more renewable energy and lots less of that oil that's producing, you know, that energy that's emitting carbon. So we're going to have a look now at some of the renewable energy generating techniques and talk a bit about you know, some of the challenges that there are with those. So here we are, this is, you can see if someone like me who worked in the oil industry offshore on oil platforms, this is a typical offshore wind farm. And you've got these big turbines on poles, lots of them, like a forest out in the sea. And then you've got this thing, which looks very much like an oil platform. And it's designed very similar, but it's slightly different. So this is the, the actual generator itself on the wind turbine. This bit's called a nasal. Um, it's got this thing that detects the wind direction back here. And there's a motor which turns the nasal round so it's pointing into the wind. Um, and then the wind makes the, the blades of the turbine rotate. And that rotates the generator at the back which generates the electricity. The electricity then goes through cables down this, it's called a monopole, it's like a tube, tubular tower down to the sea. And all of these wind turbines out at sea, they're all joined together. The cables all joined together. And they go to that thing that looks like an offshore oil platform, but it's not, it's just got lots of switches and transformers. And all these cables come in. Then there's one or two big cables, they're called export cables that go out to the shore. And um, that's a, like a weak link in these things. When they first, put in offshore wind farms off the coast of the UK and Scotland and Wales, they had a big problem with these cables because they used to get damaged and break very easily. And they're quite difficult to install. And this is why. This thing is about the size of a big ship. This is the cable installing ship. It's very large. You can see it's going up and down here in the waves. It's going forwards. Then there's a big drum on the back, which the cable's on. And the cable's coming off of that drum. It's going down in a big S shape onto the seabed. And the seabed isn't flat. It's, you know, it's got big boulders, there's hills and slopes. You've got current in the sea and the current varies, changes direction, changes its speed. And it's quite easy to mess this up. So if you think about when you're, if you're in the garden and you're uncoiling a garden hose, if you get it wrong, you get a kink formed in the garden hose and you have exactly the same thing with this cable. You end up with something like this. This is one of those big export cables with a kink in it. And it's incredibly expensive. This ship, cable lane ship, costs more than £100,000 a day to hire and the cable costs millions. So part of the challenges for engineers was to improve this process and make the whole thing a lot more reliable, which they've now done. And offshore wind farms are very, very productive. And the cost of electricity from offshore wind has reduced massively to about a third of what it used to be. Very, very good. Still on offshore wind, but this is looking at the poles now. These things are called monopoles. And if you look here, this is, it's called a crew transfer vessel. It's a small boat with a flat end. And it, what it does, it comes in and it pushes against, there's a, there's a ladder goes up here and it pushes up the end of, uh, against the ladder up against these two poles. And this chap here, dressed in the sort of red orange colored boiler suit, is a young man called Kai, um, who came and worked for me, he's from Zimbabwe. And in his first year after he left school, he worked with me um, to get his work experience before he went to university. And he was trained and still is trained to do transfers from boats like this onto these offshore wind turbines. And what he has to do, he has to wait 
until the boat is about to go up and down with the waves. And he has to wait until the boat is stationary and then step across from this step here onto the ladder. Something that requires quite a lot of training to do, but there's this fall arrest system here, so they can't actually fall into the water. Um, he just has to be trained how to do it. When he's got onto the ladder, he then climbs up and he goes onto a platform, which is just here. And then he goes through a doorway into the inside of this monopole, which is like a big hollow tube. And Kai was doing a degree in metallurgy. So when he got inside the tube, this is a photograph that Kai took inside the tube. You see it's dark, it's a bit wet, it's not, it's not brilliant, but his job was to look for cracks in the inside of the metal pole, because this monopole is being buffeted by really high waves and it can be damaged. So he was looking for cracks and then he had something like plasticine, which he spreads over the cracks and he takes uh, an impression of them, which we can then look at in the lab. Um, we do that sort of thing so that we can monitor the condition of the turbine towers and make sure that they're going to stay in good condition and keep them maintained so that they carry on operating. So what have we got next then? Okay, we're going to go away from the sea now. We're going to go back onto dry land. Um, and in my, in my app, when I was looking at the various sorts of generation, one of them is hydro, there's my app again, one of my um, sources of electricity is hydroelectricity. Um, and that is taking large amounts of water, putting them through this, this, this hydroelectric generator. Um, so what you've got here is something is it like a big water wheel with cups inside it. The water goes through there, spins a rotor shaft around. On the end of it, in this big blue box, you've got another electricity generator and that generates the electricity. And this one is a place called Manturog, which is in North Wales. It's Welsh for big boulder of Trog, which I think Trog is a um, traditional giant in Wales. The previous wind farm we're looking at is Gwinty Moor, which is also off the North Wales coast. Gwinty Moor means wind of the sea. So this power station here is quite old, it's built in the 1930s and it's immaculate, it's like it's absolutely perfectly, there's nothing, it's absolutely perfectly clean, very well maintained and the engineers there look after it and make sure it stays in good condition. But the electricity that we produce in this country from, from, from water, from hydroelectricity, um, is quite a small part of the total amount of electricity that we use and that's not true all around the world, um, and it's not true in Africa, large parts of Africa. Um, and when people talk about the climate, they talk about climate justice. Um, so when people like Extinction Rebellion talk about climate justice, they're talking partly about the climate itself. So if we have a good climate here in Europe, other people in other parts of the world um, say in Africa, need to also have a good climate. They don't want to live in somewhere that's become a desert um, where it wasn't before. People who live on islands in the Pacific don't want their island to be flooded. Um, so part of climate justice is to do with climate, but it's also to do with standard of living. Um, and we have quite a good standard of living in, in the UK and in Europe. Other parts of the world, they're developing, their standard of living is improving, and they need things like hydroelectricity um, to improve their standard of living. So this is um, a very big, it's one of the biggest power stations in Africa. This one's in Mozambique on the Zambezi River. And there are other power stations that are being built. There's one in Ethiopia, which is two and a half times the size of this one. Um, but there are issues with geography. Um, and, you know, if you've got someone downstream of this, this power station, there are issues with how they get the water and fill the lake and stuff like that. So that there's politics as well as science and engineering. If we look at this um, massive power station in Mozambique, a place called Kohorabasa, deep underneath the dam, 
there's a very big cavern and there are five generators in this cavern and the shafts of those are vertical, they go downwards. And you can see, if you look here, you can see it's actually been mined out of rock. So this is actually the rock face where they cut it back and they just haven't coated it. They've left light shining on it so you can see the rock behind the cavern. Um, and this generates a tremendous amount of electricity um, and it has to be maintained, it has to be kept in good condition. Um, if you look at this slide here, this is a man called Stelius, also a young chap who um, has graduated recently from Southampton University. And he is testing, he's doing some high voltage electrical testing on the transformers coming off of those uh, generators in the previous picture. This is actually a tunnel that runs next to that big cave. Um, he's also doing something called thermal imaging. And this is a camera which takes a photograph, but the colors tell you what temperature the surfaces have got to. So here you can see all of those three cables here. One, two, three, and they should all be at the same temperature. But this one here has got much hotter than the other two. So you can use techniques like this to work out you know, if there's something wrong with that, those cables and that, that transformer box, and then you can do something to repair it and put it right. So there's lots of engineers um, Mozambique has got some tremendous um, local engineers. Uh, Celius was out there setting up some tests for them. Uh, the guys in Mozambique are brilliant, they're really good. So it, 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 there's lots that can be done, um, both to install new generating equipment, renewable generating equipment, and to make sure it carries on operating correctly. Back in the UK, you've seen solar panels on houses you can also get massive, really big solar power stations, um, EV solar, photovoltaic it's called. Um, and you can see this one, it's got thousands literally of panels all spread out over a long area. Um, and I've said, well, well, that's got to be maintained. It's got to be sustainable. There's actually um, a cost, there's a carbon cost in producing panels because you have to heat silicon up to quite a high temperature um, and set all this lot up and you've got to think about what you're going to do when it comes to the end of its life. You're going to leave it there, you're going to take it all away and turn it back to a green field again, or you're going to build another power station, solar panel power station to replace this one. And geography is a big issue because if you look at this area here, uh, it, it's probably quite good farmland um, and what happens on occasions near where I live, there was one of, going to be one of these farms and the local people complained at the planning commission stage, said we don't want that here. Um, so geography can be a big issue and people can be uh, not happy about having something like this built in their neighbourhood. Um, my other photograph is another solar farm. This is in a desert location um, and there our schemes to put solar farms in the desert, both in North Africa and in the Arabian Gulf. And if you do that, there are lots of advantages. One, because it would, one, that's where the sun is, is hottest, um, so there's the most energy to be gained. And also because a lot of these areas have very little biodiversity. There isn't actually a lot there. Um, so you can put these things there without destroying the environment so much. And then if you think, supposing you had that in North Africa, you could export the energy that you produced to say large African cities, which could then make use of the very cheap energy, or you could even um, take cables across the Mediterranean and export it to Europe, which would make um, income for, you know, wherever these, these solar farms are installed. So there's lots of potential there but it requires security. You couldn't put big solar farms like this into Northern Europe unless there's political security and unless the people who live there are getting some benefits for it, from it, so they're happy for it to be put there. Right, other types of um, power station we can look at. 
Um, nuclear power stations. This is an example of a nuclear power station. So it's still got your water cooling towers. Um, so because you're still using water, if we look at the, the way that it works. See these two things here, those are containment vessels. They're big reinforced concrete structures. Inside them, there's a nuclear reactor. So you've got nuclear radioactive material there. Um, you've got control rods to control the temperature that you get to. That produces heat and that then heats up water exactly the same as you did in the thermal plant, like a coal um, fired power station. The steam then turns a, a big steam turbine, which turns a generator, um, and that creates electricity. You've got the cooling towers. So, and that doesn't produce carbon. You're not putting carbon out into the atmosphere. Um, so you'd think that that was good, um, but a lot of environmentalists are not happy with nuclear um, for two reasons, really. One, you can have um, accidents. So if you think of Chernobyl, uh, Chernobyl uh, was a major nuclear accident um, where the, the reaction got out of control. There was a big explosion and that then produced pollution, which polluted the environment. I would say you have to think about what you're going to do with the radioactive material when you finished using it in the reactor. So I know I've worked at some nuclear power stations and the waste material can have very long half-life. So you have material that has a half-life of um, over a thousand years. So that means that the, the neutrons they change from one material to a less radioactive material, but they do it in a, in, in a very slow process. So 50% of the material will have changed in a thousand years, another thousand years, another 50% of the 50% will have changed. It, what that means is that to stop that radioactive material being used by somebody like a terrorist, you have to secure that material for a long, long time into the future. Now, there are some big issues there, and some issues that have you know, caused people major concerns. So another um, way of generating electricity is to use something called biomass. And a lot of coal powered power stations are being upgraded to burn biomass and biomass are pellets like the ones in the photograph and they come from from um, wood so basically um, you could take sawdust from say a furniture manufacturing process and you could put it into pellets like this then you could burn them in a boiler and create heat then heat water to create steam and then run that through a steam turbine and generate electricity but to do it in large quantities, you actually have to grow trees, particularly for this purpose. And when you do that, what you've got then is a plantation of trees, all exactly the same type, all spread out in rows. And that has issues for biodiversity. Um, the reason why it can be described as a green generating process, as a renewable generating process, is that while the trees are growing, they're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. When you burn the trees, you put the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere and you could say, well, that's a cyclic process if you keep doing it. The part of the problem with it is that the, the process requires some carbon to carry the process. You actually have to turn the, the, the wood into pellets and you have to transport the, the wood pellets to the power station. Um, so there is some carbon being produced. The, in, the, in the UK, there's, Drax is one of the really big coal-fired power stations which are being converted to biomass. And the Drax people will say that their intention is to make it what's called carbon negative. And that means that they burn biomass but they don't let the carbon go into the atmosphere, they capture it. And if you do that, you then have to think what you're gonna do with it. So you end up taking CO2 
Um, you have to store it somewhere. And there's lots of ideas for how you could store it. You could put it into um, one of those formations where you've got the oil out in the North Sea. You could pump it under the sea um, a long way down through the oil wells. I say like 3,000 feet, you know, 1,000 meters below the sea. Um, and you know, then hopefully it would stay there and it wouldn't leak back out. The oil stayed there, so you would like to think that the, the, um, the carbon containing gas would stay there as well. There are also plans to do things like have big underground caverns and make giant blooms. And you, 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 put, you put the, uh, the CO2 into um, those caverns. I've actually mixed up my ideas there because the, the electricity storage also uses the same process. We'll come on to that in a minute. So we're on to storage now. Um, and one of the big problems with renewable electricity like um, wind and solar is that what do you do when the wind's not blowing and the sun isn't shining? Um, and the method that has been used in the past and is still used now is to do a thing called pump storage. So you have a big reservoir at the top of the mountain somewhere, and you have another reservoir at the bottom of the mountain. And what you do when you want electricity is you let the water flow down through pipes through the mountain, down through a hydroelectric power station, and then down to the lower reservoir. And that creates electricity, but you can only do it while you've got water in this top reservoir. And then what you do when you don't need, when you've got surplus electricity, say at night in this occasion, um, you turn the thing round and you use the generator like a pump and you take electricity out of the grid and you pump the water back up to the top again. So it's coming from here, it's going back up to the top. And you can do that for as long as you like, as long as you've got electricity to use. And that has been used in the UK, in Wales particularly, links to nuclear power stations. So a nuclear power station produces electricity all the time continuously for the base load. When you don't need the nuclear power, you just use it to pump the water back up the hill. Energy storage is a big issue for renewable energy. In California, there are massive solar farms, really big. And they produce so much electricity that for large periods of time, they can't actually use them because they're producing too much electricity for, um, uh, for demand. The demand isn't as much as electricity, so they have to be turned off. And effectively, electricity is getting wasted. And ideally, they need to store that electricity so they can use it during the night when the sun isn't shining. So there's a big challenge around storage. And I talked about balloons, the, the real potential use for balloons, massive balloons in an underground cave, for, ex for example, is if you have surplus electricity, you can actually pump air into a big, enormous balloon. And you can compress, effectively you're pumping compressed air into a, an enormous underground balloon in a cave. And then when you need to use electricity because the wind's not blowing and the sun isn't shining, you let the compressed air back out and it goes through a turbine that looks like a gas turbine and it generates electricity. And that is a sort of plan that people have going forward. And the other one that we're more likely to use in this country is battery storage. So people who have a solar panel on the roof of their house usually have something like a few car batteries or something like a car battery that they use to store the electricity that they're using. They charge up the battery, that's what they use it for, and then they use that electricity when they need it. This is something much, much bigger. This is like a giant warehouse full of enormous batteries. And it can be the size of a power station. You can have like you know, two gigawatt one of these potentially. Um, there's an awful lot of energy required to build it. Um, but if you link it into a system with renewable energy, then there's a lot of potential there. And there's a lot of potential to ensure that you know, there's a continuous supply of electricity. And these are being built. There's one being built in Japan. 
um, very large with all sorts of control systems and monitoring. And yeah, it's seen as being part of the solution, the way forward. And I've almost finished now. The, um, the Kids Field project that I'm involved in is all about encouraging young people to take up careers in engineering to help solve the climate crisis. And there's loads of engineering challenges, but people who want to get involved in engineering, this is an amazing time to do it. There's so much going on. And these are just some of the things that people were working on. We talked about energy storage. Um, one solution that we haven't looked at at all is hydrogen. You can, there's lots of hydrogen, it's in the atmosphere, it's in water. You can use um, hydrogen fuel cells as a way of creating electricity. You can, those gas turbines that we looked at, using natural gas from oil fields, um, you can use hydrogen instead. And hydrogen doesn't contain carbon, so you can burn hydrogen. Uh, you can do it in small amounts, up to 30% hydrogen with natural gas, and you don't have to change the gas turbines. Um, more than that, you do have to change them. Um, if you've ever, I don't know if you can do it now, but when I was doing my chemistry at school, you could take a, um, a test tube, you could fill it full of hydrogen, you put a light over the top of it, and, toof, pop, and a big flame would come out the top. So hydrogen produces a long flame. It's a different sort of flame than natural gas. So if you use it at 100%, you have to modify the gas turbines. And there's other stuff we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. Electric planes, electric ships, sailing ships. Sailing ships is brilliant. I, I, I go sailing. And we're actually designing modern sailing ships to sail around the world and we'll deliver cargo. Ones have gone across the Atlantic, Mediterranean, um, to France and back. There's a lot of work going on in sailing ships. Electric planes, electric ships, electric cars, they would be most successful by helping to solve the climate crisis when our electricity is coming from renewable sources. So the two things have to go together. Um, community energy, um, I know I mean, my old Woodcraft group was Tolworth and Kingston. There's a new energy project called the Berrylands Community Power Project, I think if I remember rightly. And that is to put lots of solar panels on houses across quite a wide area and then to generate their own electricity. So there are community schemes going on as well. Um, part of the solution is to cut down on the amount of energy that we're using. So zero carbon buildings, you know, that's buildings that they may generate their own electricity, but they also are very well insulated, um, have very um, good heating systems. And then carbon capture is, um, we've looked at a bit, that's what they're hoping to do with um, biomass. They could also do that with things like gas turbines. So it's, that's just some examples of some of the energy challenge, engineering challenges. This is an amazing time to get involved in engineering. There's a tremendous amount that needs to be done and in a very short period of time, because we need to have most of these things done by 2030, that's 10 years from now. And that's the, the Kids Field Project, uh, which the Woodcraft folk are just getting off the ground now, really, because it was stopped because of COVID. Um, and we'll be working with um, youth groups, schools, and hopefully at some festivals over the next year, 18 months. I think I'll stop at that point. Perfect, thank you so much, Paul. That's okay, it's a pleasure. It's really very um, interesting. I'm just